Good afternoon, good after hot noon to you guys. So we're getting there, it's summertime. What is it, uh, 4th of July is coming up. So even if you're not a tennis buff, I believe the entire world was watching Serena Williams play in her wild card Wimbledon first round. And those of you who are tennis buffs, you know that she has been out injured since this time last year during the first round of Wimbledon when she slipped and fell on the wet grass that they didn't allow anyone to practice on. So the very last minute, we it was announced that Serena's got a wild card and the week before she played doubles at Eastbourne. And I think we were just all excited just to see her play again. Tennis has been kind of boring since she hasn't been in the game. And then, of course, more of the world, the non-tennis world, probably saw the movie King Richard, and then I think they had a greater appreciation for the Williams sisters and everything about them. And so it was just interesting when she played, it was just so much excitement. But the thing that makes you so excited about Serena, if you are a tennis player, is her confidence, her belief in her serve, her belief in her ability to just defy all odds that you could be out for a year, you're 40 years old, still, you know, a little overweight or whatever, and come out there and just dazzle us the way that she did. So I want to ask you the question today, what do you have faith in? A faith that's just undeniable, a faith that not only you believe in, but others around you can see see it and feel it and believe it by your demonstration and your faith. What is it in your life that is like that? And no matter who you are and where you are in life and no matter how much faith and confidence you have and various things that you do, as believers, as Christians, we ought to have that level of undeniable faith in our belief that God is on the throne and he is in control of our lives and everything that's going on around us, especially when we're doing what we know we're supposed to be doing for those who are called by his name and called and living according to his will and so that kind of faith is what we're talking about we've finally gotten out of chapter one and mark we're moving into chapter two again the gospel of mark is so dynamic it is about teaching us how to be more like christ it's focusing on the things that happen the things that we can do to emulate his behavior, to emulate the heart, the love of Christ. And in this particular section, as we move into chapter two, it's a demonstration of how to get to that level. It comes from what you really believe. I think, think I've said a phrase more than any other phrase during the pandemic than I don't believe that believers believe in what they're selling. <laughs> they just don't believe that we believe that God is on the throne, that God is in control, that God is bigger than COVID, that God knows and can and is able. I just don't think that we believe that. And that is what we're selling. And if we're not selling it, we need to flip the script and that's what we're supposed to be selling. And so here is an example of a faith that could not be denied. Such an incredible level of faith that it just, it impressed our Lord. And this is how the story goes. Many of you have heard this story, but maybe the emphasis wasn't on just, not just the faith of the one that needed to be healed, but even more important, the faith of his friends. And so not only is our faith important, but it's important that we surround ourselves with other people that have that faith and that assurance and that confidence that, you know, God has this. And that's what's important. I was just talking to an individual this morning whose mother is about to enter into hospice and, you know, he's bringing her home to live with him. And I was just saying, you know, the incredible thing about that is that your mother is such a devout Christian. And when you're having to care for or do for people that believe in God and they can pray for themselves and believe in their prayers and, you know, that's a whole whole different level of you know that's that's just that's a blessing and so here the scripture we're just doing the first six verses in chapter two and it says jesus forgives and heals a paralytic and again they entered cape canapran why do i always screw up on that uh, the fishing town after some days and it was heard that he was in the house Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, and not even near the door. 
and he preached and the word and he preached the word to them. Then they came, where is my next page? Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemous like this? Who could forgive but God alone? So we're not supposed to be in verse 7. We're going to end right there at verse 6. The focus is just on the healing piece. We'll come back and deal with the scribes in two weeks. And so the important thing to remember here is that it says that Jesus saw their faith. Jesus saw their faith. Of course, we know that he knows everything, so he knew their faith, but he saw their faith is where the emphasis is placed. And then also to pay attention to the fact that he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. And so of course, we'll have to do a little bit of background information here just on the fact that this is the first, this, this particular instance is repeated in all three of the synoptic gospels, but only here do they mention that Jesus is coming back to his hometown, which leads us to believe that the house that they're talking about is the same house that he left before he went on the short preaching circuit to the various synagogues. Remember when he left Peter's mother's house to go pray, he, his prayer was, Peter came to get him and saying, everybody's looking for you. And his prayer, uh, after his prayer, he said, let us go to the other villages. So this is to be, Mark puts it in less than a chapter, but we can assume that maybe for two, four, three months or more, he went on to a preaching circuit to the various synagogues and the other villages, and now he finds himself coming back to Peter's mother's house. This scene where, yes, Peter's mother was healed of the fever, but just prior to that, Jesus had healed the leper and the man with the demonic spirit, both of which are just two incredible diseases and illnesses to have back then, and just with speaking a word, both of them were healed, and both of them apparently went back and told everybody that they could. Everybody knew about it. So when they get word that Jesus is heading back to Peter's house, before you could blink, the house itself was overflowing. Then we have to understand how things were. So you're talking about a fisherman's house. A fisherman's house is a modest house. So most of these houses are basically composed of one room or so sectioned off with drapes or a pillow or something that separates the kitchen from the living room so you have this open space because they're so small you don't have like an entryway or anything so the front door literally opens to the street and so where it em emphasizes here that it was packed to the door so people couldn't get in people could no longer get in but you have these men that heard that this man that healed the demonic the man with the demonic spirit this man that healed the leper by simply speaking a word. He didn't, they didn't know necessarily about the healing of Peter's mother because that was done in private. But the other two were told all around the town. And so these guys, wherever they are, they're friends with this individual who's paralyzed. And they say, here's someone that can heal you. And they say it in a manner that they know it and they believe it. And so what is their goal? Their goal is that we must get you to him by all means necessary. And so when we start acting and working and doing what we do, we must do it with that same type of faith belief. By all means necessary, bring our, our needs, our, our, our supplications to the throne of God because he is able and we must believe that and we must believe that however that goes it is because God is looking at the whole picture and it's going to work out for our good and ultimately it has already worked out for our good for those of us who believe we know where eternity is for us and so our object sometimes has to just be focused on that and understanding the struggle that takes place here. 
As long as we live in this body that we call the flesh, there's going to be a struggle. The closer we get to God, the closer we walk with him, the more we want to do his will, the more we want to love our fellow man, the harder our struggle is going to be because the, the flesh is diametrically opposed to that. So all the things that we hear and we see to project these images that you come to Christ and now your life is easy and all your blessings come flowing down and, you know, snap your hands three times and turn around and claim it and... Yeah, no, that's not true. But the real blessing and the real peace of mind comes from the understanding of who we are, whose we are, where we're going. And that in our struggle here, he's still with us. The struggle doesn't leave, but he's still with us. So that's what these men are like. Got to get to this guy. Got to get to this guy. And so then you, you see it happening. So they get here, can't get to him because the inside is filled and then the doors are filled so you've got people standing around just trying to get a sniff of what's being said isn't that amazing that that kind of power was there before social media before the internet before you know what's trending everybody knew mm, this is where you need to be and can I just get a just just a little snip of what he's saying but that wasn't enough these people wanted to drop their friend at the feet of the person that could look upon him and heal him. And so in those days too, these same type of houses were very moderate, uh, uh, standard. They usually had beams that were about three feet apart in between the beam space. You could fill it with brush, you know, leaves and, and, and twigs and things. And eventually they would kind of like solidify. But that's basically the only thing that was there you didn't have what we have now installation and roofing and blah so that was your installation and roofing and my point being is that so you could come up on top of a roof and the roofs were flat and the houses were no higher than eight feet tall so a lot of times there was a ladder on the side of the house because it was so small and because back then people had large families it gave the taker, the giver of the, not the giver, but the provider of the house, assuming that the man worked the hardest, an opportunity to just rest and get away from the noise and everything that was going on in the family. So there would always be a ladder outside of the house that you could just go and the roof offered like a patio or a deck setting where you could just kind of be at peace for a while. And so people knew this. They knew that there would be a ladder there, and they also knew that if you needed to get from the roof inside of the house, it would just be a matter of removing the brush from between the three-foot spaces where the beams were going. So this, this is what we're assuming happened because they, it doesn't get into a lot of detail. It just says that they couldn't get in the front door, so they went upon the roof. They opened up the roof and dropped the man down at the feet of Jesus. So that's something that is usually quickly just kind of read over in the other Gospels, but here it's pointed out because this again is what Peter is trying to, Mark is trying to get us to become more like Christ, to become disciples. How do we get to that point of following him? And so think about this. You've got someone that's paralyzed, so there's no movement going on. So we can just assume, they said that they were carrying him, we can assume on a stretcher, maybe even on like a uh, not a cart, but just the mattress pad in itself. It has four friends. We have to assume that one was at each corner. So you have these four friends, one at each corner. you got this guy. He's paralyzed, so you're probably talking 150, 200 pounds. You come into a house, can't get in, but they're thinking we're going up on the roof. So first of all, the individuals themselves to say that we are going to figure out how to get you paralyzed on this mattress up this staircase up to eight feet high roof move the stuff off of the roof and let you down at the center of the house where no doubt Jesus is standing there speaking to people that says a lot about his friends that talks about the things that we've been talking about in the first chapter Love your fellow man. Do for others as you would want people to do for you. It says love love your fellow man as yourself. What does that mean? Sometimes I tell people, that's not, it's easy to be nice to people. You know, it's easy to say, you know, brother, I, I, I feel you. You don't have a job, but I'm praying for you. But how about, hey, brother, I feel you. You don't have a job. I'm praying for you. And here's $500 until you get a job. And I'm going to do that again in two weeks. So that's the piece. 
that talks about as yourself, because if you were in that position, would you just want someone offering up their prayers? Yes, because we know the power of prayers, but how about a prayer and 500 bucks? And so that is what you would want someone to do. And so that's the, the key to that piece of loving someone else as yourself, that golden rule, that golden commandment. Putting yourself, I say all the time, put yourself in the shoes of the other individual and then act accordingly. And so that is what these men are doing. These men are thinking, if I were paralyzed, I would want my friends to figure out how to get me through this crowd and through to the feet of Jesus. And that is exactly what they did. Not just their confidence and belief that we can do this, but when we do this, this is gonna make all of the difference in the world to our friend's life, and we're gonna figure out how to do that. And we're going to do whatever is necessary, by whatever means necessary. Are you willing to do for your friends by whatever means necessary? Are we willing to be sacrificed? Too many times people say, you know what? Well, I, you have time to do that, Dallas, or whatever. You know, it's like nothing is convenient. Is it convenient to just take two hours out of the middle of your work day to bring this message to you or whatever? It's about sacrifice. It's about saying that if this is going to change one person's life, if the food part is going to help somebody get healthier, if the, the a spiritual part is going to, in fact, bring someone closer to Christ, have someone begin to search for more godliness, Absolutely, it's about the sacrifice, and that is what makes a difference. It's the sacrificial giving that we we're, we're 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 taught to do. You can't beat God's giving, you know. That's what these guys did. So that's cool. You got these four friends that are willing to do whatever is necessary to help their friend get to a better life. Then it also talks a lot about the faith of the individual. Now here's somebody that's been paralyzed. Now you have to assume. That if he has four friends that are willing to carry him on a mat, I don't know how many miles, to get to this place, and friends that would go as far as to say, how can we get him on the roof and get him down? These are probably friends that were pretty good friends, period. And so even though he was paralyzed, he wasn't paralyzed and alone. We have to assume that life was rough for him, but he had four friends that made it livable. And so a lot of times when people get in that place where they haven't been employed for a very long time, they haven't had, they learn to kind of get comfortable getting a government check, kind of getting comfortable and not having to work as hard or getting a disability or whatever the case may be. So you have to look at this guy too, because this guy says, you know what? I am also going to have faith and confidence. I'm going to trust you that you can get me up this flight of steps onto a roof you can lift me down carefully enough where i don't die in the process of trying to get healed of something that hasn't killed me so it talks tremendously about the faith of not just the friends but the faith of the individual and then we get to the feet of jesus and we see the attitude of christ again and again and again so he's not there saying, okay, obviously, during this time, so we have to mention this. So back during this time, it was often said that a lot of sickness and disease was directly parallel to sin and your behavior. And it was thought to be, when you do a little research on this, that this particular condition of becoming paralyzed had a lot to do with a certain type of lifestyle that one acquired at a young adult age or something so it's kind of like suggesting that this man became paralyzed after living somewhat of a loose life somewhere in time and so Jesus knows because he knows everything so he knows this and he says to the man I've seen your faith you had enough faith to believe that regardless of what you've done based on what you've heard other people say about my teachings and my healing you had enough faith to allow these men to bring you up a stair, throw you down a rooftop, some eight feet drop, just to get to my feet and having the belief to know that I would heal you in spite of the fact that you've had these sins or you've done this sinful behavior. You know, remember this is before the resurrection. So this is what's happening here too. And Jesus sees that. He sees that based on true authentic sincere behavior and that is what we have to believe too sometimes we think that we have to do these things or we do things that 
aren't genuine or they're not coming from our heart. And people know that. People know that when you come to pray for them when they're in the hospital, whether or not you're just checking a, a bullet point because it's on the deacon's to-do list versus whether you're coming and you're sincerely caring about them and you're praying with a heart of care and love versus one of uh, to check the to-do list. And so that too, and so what do we need to do to get our heart to a place like that? Again, putting ourselves in the shoes of the other individuals. And we can only do that by establishing relationships. Too many times, the people that, the very people we minister to, we don't take time to even know who they are or what they are, or what their families are like. When I was at that ministry at the nursing home, oh my God, it took up so much of my life because I tried to just sit and commune with these people. And it was the best experience in life. I mean, it just was so fruitful. I don't know who benefited more, the residents or myself. And so that's our Jesus. Our Jesus is telling us that the lovely, lovely part about this story is that no matter what you've done in life, he's saying, I am God. I created you. My main thing is that the loss will be found, that you will come and return back to me in this fallen world, that you may have eternal life to come. Believe that I sent my only beloved son to live and to die for you that you may have the gift of eternal life. I am not angry with you. I want to forgive you. I want to say your sins are forgiven, be well. And again, we have be well. So did he say, do you want to walk again? No, he first started out by saying your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven gives this man a mental attitude of peace. And then the physical part that you can walk again. He picked up that mat, whatever it was that they carried him in there on under his arm and left out. And so Jesus once again is demonstrating that not only is he concerned about our spiritual well-being. Yes, your sins are forgiven. Allow your mind to be at peace. You know, come and listen and, 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 and tell the good news. Tell the story that there was a man that forgave you of your sins and healed your body physically. And so Jesus is one that is concerned about our health, our mental state, as well as our physical state. So in that, we're going to transition just to, you know, what is your faith on a hot day that's going to cool you off? <laughs> it would be ice cream. <laughs> it would be ice cream. But because we are trying to do this thing holistically in a manner that is going to benefit you best, we are not doing regular ice cream. So what we're doing is, why do people like ice cream? Because it's cold, it's soothing, and it tastes good. And what makes people think that ice cream tastes good? Sugar. And so what do we do to get our bodies sick and ill and cranky and achy? We eat sugar. We've got to get away to get away from white sugar, white flour, and salt. And so what we're constantly doing every week is we're trying to just show you a different way, an alternative way the holistic way. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you something that's going to be cool and refreshing and it's going to taste good and it's going to be sugary, but it's going to be the natural sugar, the natural sugar that is beneficial to the body because of the way that the body assimilates it and digests it. It's able to actually eliminate it in a manner that is proactive to the system. And then it's simple. Remember the commercial of Breyer's ice cream where it says it's simple. It's only got three ingredients. I think it's milk, berry, milk, fruit, and sugar. You know, so uh, that one big ingredient that it has is not doing so well for us. So this one has basically four basic ingredients. The other ingredients that you see are going to be based on what else you want to do. Some people like vanilla ice cream. Many people don't like vanilla ice cream. They like vanilla ice cream, but they want more. They want chocolate with it. They want strawberry and cream or whatever. So we just have a variety of fruits to show you how you can do things differently. But we have the staple ingredients. So the staple ingredients are going to be raw cashews and dates. And so cashew is like the brain nut. Um, all nuts, I tell you, we need to get a variety of nuts and seeds on a daily basis along with our whole fruits and raw vegetables. Um, dates are probably the sweetest thing on the planet, technically, literally. And the Bible talks a lot about dates, uh, and so you can go and do some research on that. But more importantly, dates have a lot of minerals in them. Magnesium, copper, a lot of good stuff is going on in the dates, in addition to the fact that, the fact that it's a good source of fat. So we use the dates primarily for the sweetness factor. This is going to be our substitute for sugar in this. 
and then it's also going to give us that nutrient dense food uh, selection. Now what I'm going to use is mangoes. So these are frozen mangoes. They were frozen a minute ago. So we have about a cup or so of frozen mangoes. The larger ingredients will be the dates and the liquid and I'm keeping that in the freezer as long as I can. So we're going to use fresh squeezed orange juice. About two cups of that. I have about two cups of dates. You can you know, modify the, the amount of the ingredients depending on how many people you're serving or if you just want one little serving. The thing about this is it's so simple to make. You really only want to make enough that you can eat it right then and there because it's best when it's just come right out of the blender. But you can always blend it, put it in some containers and refreeze it and do whatever you want. Uh, but it's an easy thing to do if you have guests, you're entertaining, right after they finish eating something, you just pull it out, it takes 10 minutes and it's a nice little educational exercise as well. So we also have frozen bananas. So again, when you're doing this, it's the dates and the orange juice that are going to be about the equivalent. I have one cup of cashews, one cup of raw uh, frozen bananas, a cup of frozen mango, and I love raspberries and everything. Raspberries singly are probably the best fiber food for you. The millions of yellow seeds that you see in raspberries, the more seeds that you have in a fruit, the higher the fiber content. So the dietary fiber associated with just this little half a cup of raspberries is phenomenal. And, I, and when I say that, I mean that. And so what I try to do is eat at least a half a cup of raspberries, blueberries, blackberries every single day. That is going to be so beneficial for making sure that you keep cancer at bay, keeping your gastrointestinal system as healthy as possible, the amount of dietary fiber you get in fresh berries, and then the anti uh, carcinogen, so many other things. That, and then it's red, so that's moving the blood. The blueberries are good for the mind. The orange mango obviously is good for the skin. And then I have these fresh peach, peaches that I got from the farmer's market that just have like an incredible taste to it. So I kind of threw those on at the last minute I'm going to slice them up and throw them on top of the actual ice cream. And if you want it to be even sweeter, you can add uh, fresh coconut to it. So this is probably more than two cups of orange juice. And you just kind of, since I knew this stuff needed to thaw out a bit because this stuff was frozen as a rock. So I'm just going to... It's a little bit more than two. I'll start with a little, just in case I need to blend it down a bit to thin it out. And sometimes as you're growing and you're learning how to do these things, you'll find that you have hard ingredients, even though I've soaked the uh, dates for a few minutes, they're harder to turn. I don't like to use the blender on high. Now this is a blend tech, so it doesn't use that enormous uh, uh, heart furry uh, uh, motor that like the Vitamix uses because we're dealing with raw food so we want to try and maintain the integrity of the live enzymes so a lot of times I still just use the medium thing so a lot of times it's good to just do that instead of throwing all of your ingredients in you take based on the textures and the stiffness of a few ingredients, kind of do those first, get them out of the way. So obviously the cashews would come next. Do you remember the people in the South, when well, my grandparents and my aunts make their homemade pound cakes that are just to die for. They were to die for, they're still to die for. That's why I don't put it out here. But they take one ingredient, they put the eggs in, and. They mix it with the flour, then they add the butter, and then they mix that. So they do one ingredient at a time. And it's ice cream, so we want it to be on the thick side. That's why you usually can use the frozen fruit. I just didn't want it to be rock hard. And then you can also drink it or just make it and then refreeze it. See how each time you add a frozen ingredient, it kind of stiffens it up a bit. 
And these, like I said, this stuff isn't nearly as frozen as it was a couple minutes ago. As you guys know, I don't use air conditioning. I just <laughs> like the way it feels on my skin so it's a little warmer in here when you said something out frozen I guess I was talking for more than 15 minutes and it thawed out pretty quickly so now we'll into small containers and throw it into the freezer or I could take something else frozen out of the freezer and put it in here to have it be that's just incredible it's just amazing what you can do with just a little bit of the right stuff I'm so glad I live alone and I can do this this is so good and so it's, it's thick enough where you could spoon it. You know, it'd be more like a, a creamy sorbet. I mean, it's not, it's just thick enough where you can kind of divulge in it with a spoon, but not a straw. And so that's where you dump your berries in, your fresh peaches. But you know me, I love additional nuts, so I would probably put some chopped walnuts on there. You could put some sprinkles of fresh coconut. You can do some fresh, any other type of fresh fruit. You can slice the pineapple, do whatever. But here's your, your ice cream. You can pour it into containers as large as this. Put some shrink wrap over it. Put it into the freezer for just a few minutes, and then it will be just stiff enough for people to do what they want to do. And that is the faith of knowing that on a hot day, I need something cool that's not going to be sugary, that's going to make me a little bit more frustrated than I think, but it's going to be nice. And I have complete faith and confidence that if you came to my place and you are a sugar addict, that I could feed you this and you would be like, wow, that was really good. Where can I get that? So um, that's the faith I want you to have in God and in your life, knowing that he is in control no matter what situation that you're facing right now, no matter what is coming down on the pipe, to just keep trusting and believing that God has this because he has you because you've committed yourself to him. So enjoy your 4th of July. We will see you in two weeks, and uh, we'll talk about the attitude of the scribes then. All right? Have a good one.